for today and your blessings for us and uh, all the good things that you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your love and your grace and for your death on the cross to forgive us of our sins. We pray for each and every person that's been mentioned today. and We know, Heavenly Father, you're able to heal, to comfort, and to be there with us in our time of need. And We just pray that you'd be with each one of them. We thank you, Lord, for what you've already done for us, and we just look forward to what you're going to do in the future. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for, for, for preserving us through the pandemic and bringing us here to today. And we pray that as we sing, we'll open our hearts and minds and souls to you, Lord, in praise for all that you've done. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Well, let's all stand and join together in singing, You Are Worthy of My Praise. Turn me up up here just a little bit, Caleb. There you go. I will worship with all of my heart. I will praise you with all of my strength. I will seek you all of my days.
Take your Bible this morning. Turn over to the book of Psalms. The 43rd Psalm. Vindicate me, God, and defend my cause against an ungodly nation. We'll just stop there and pray for a while. Rescue me from the deceitful and unjust man. For you are the God of my refuge. Why have you rejected me? Why must I go about in sorrow because of the enemy's oppression? Send your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain your dwelling place. Then I will come to the altar of God, to God my greatest joy. I will praise you with the lyre, God, my God. Why am I so depressed? Why this turmoil within me? Put your hope in God, for I will still praise him, my Savior, and my God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you today uh, for allowing us to gather here. Uh, God, the words of the psalmist this morning uh, echo uh, the words, I believe, of your people uh, in this uh, time in which we live. Uh, God, that we, uh, we, we need your rescue. Uh, God, we need your hope. Uh, we need your encouragement. Uh, God, in a, uh, in a ungodly nation, a nation that is, seems to be uh, growing more ungodly uh, by the moment, uh, that uh, seems like every day the new decisions made, new rulings made, laws passed that, uh, that uh, go further and uh, further against uh, your word and against your commandments. Uh, and Lord, we just pray that uh, you would uh, comfort your people, that you would give us courage, uh, God, to stand up for uh, the truth of your word, to stand up uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, to be your ambassadors, uh, that no matter how uh, vile and how wicked uh, our world may become, Lord, that we know that uh, our hope uh, is in you, uh, that our confidence is in you. Uh, and God, we pray that uh, you would just uh, put that, uh, that, that encouragement uh, into the hearts uh, of your people. And we'll give you the honor uh, for all that you do, which in Jesus' precious name I pray.
take your Bible this morning to us, the Gospel of John. John, the 19th chapter. While you're doing that, I hadn't uh, mentioned it lately. Uh, kind of out of sync a little bit, not having uh, ushers and offering uh, after 50 some years of doing it that way. Again, just remind you that the uh, buckets are at uh, the door as you go out uh, or as you come in. I, I've noticed a lot of people dropping it on their way in. And so uh, I know that uh, a lot of, a lot of um, the church gurus or whatever they are now um, kind of encourage churches uh, not to take up an offering, to have it like that, to have a, uh, a basket at the door as people go out, not to really mentioned the offering, and <clears throat> I have a real issue with that. Uh, I think that uh, the offering is uh, a major, probably the largest act of worship uh, that we do while we're here. Uh, we can get most anybody to try to sing. Um, you could get most anybody to preach, uh, but uh, it takes a real act of faith uh, to reach into your billfold and take what limited resources you have uh, and turn them over uh, and give them back to the Lord. And so uh, I like, one of the big main things I look forward to of getting rid of uh, COVID is being able to actually uh, take up an offering uh, and, uh, and, and have a, uh, again, a, what I think is the highest act of worship uh, that we uh, do when we gather. Uh, while I'm there, let me thank you for worshiping so well the last year. Uh, we are roughly now uh, coming up on a year uh, of uh, this um, unusual uh, situation. Uh, I put a thing on social media this week that said, I'm tired of being part of a worldwide event. Uh, and uh, I said, it, uh, thank you for your, your faithfulness to continue uh, to give and uh, support your church ministries uh, there uh, and uh, appreciate that and again uh, I had uh, somebody <clears throat> send me a message I may have told it, I don't remember uh, last Sunday morning asked me how many of the churches Baptist churches in the area had closed during this and we've actually had zero uh, we um, have had none of our churches we've had some that uh, have struggled a little bit but uh, God has been faithful, God's people uh, have been generous seeing some progress, I think, even uh, in the church. And so uh, appreciate your faithfulness. Uh, again, remind you that if you want to give uh, online, uh, if you will text the word POPLAR uh, to 73256. Uh, if you're online watching with us and you'd like to help support uh, the work here in the ministries, uh, or if you're just sitting here and uh, you don't want to throw your offering in a bucket, Text it uh, 73256 to the word Poplar, uh, and it goes straight where it needs to go. Your giving record gets uh, credited like it's supposed to. Uh, it's really, a, again, it's really a good way, a uh, good safe way uh, to give. And so uh, remember that. Uh, and uh, somebody uh, has suggested to me uh, that we take up a uh, special offering. Everybody's getting their tax returns, and well, most of you's getting your stimulus check. I hadn't seen mine. I don't know. Uh, I still hadn't got mine. I'm, they're talking about giving fourteen hundred more. I'm still waiting on the first six hundred. So, uh, so uh, any of y'all got your six hundred? You want to contribute? You know, uh, you want to help me out? I said because I haven't. I guess I've ranted and raved about the government so long. They just said, well, he doesn't get his. I don't know. Uh, but um, I said it would be. Uh, you know, if you. God leads you that way, and you want to put a little extra in particular uh, into the building fund, I'd love uh, to see this, this building paid for. Uh, we are knocking it out slowly but surely, uh, and, um, but uh, if you'd like to uh, take some of your stimulus and stimulate uh, our uh, loan payment, that would be awesome. All right, uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, I want to speak to you this morning on a topic that I think is... Uh, probably more 
more relevant today than we have than it has ever been in in our history, and that is the characteristics of a cow. Characteristics of a cow. We 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 live in a day and a time when I don't think there has ever been a point in history where it is more important for Christians, for God's people, to have a backbone, to have a voice, to have courage. It is certainly obvious if you turn on the news, if you read the paper, that the, and I'm just going to lump them all in one group, the anti-God groups certainly are extremely bold, are certainly extremely outspoken. I'm going to tell you something that may rattle some of you's cage, but there is a video online of one of the abortion doctors over at Latrobe Drive who drives into the the clinic there. Well, I don't even know if clinic is probably not a good word to call that death factory. Uh, that, uh, but he pulls in, and the protesters are all standing out there. Uh, and this man, who is a medical professional, uh, supposedly been to medical school, rolls down his window and, uh, and and yells at the protesters standing there, "Rape them all and send them to me." Certainly, the anti-godly establishment is bolder than it's ever been. It, there is no, as the young people say, there is no shame in their game. Uh, the, the laws that are being passed and the laws that are being pushed for, the actions and the activities, uh, again, of the anti-God, uh, and, and that covers a lot of places. Uh, are, uh, are are off the charts uh, in their boldness. It is certainly time uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ uh, to stand up uh, for the truth uh, of God's Word. And I want you to look with me this morning. We're going to look at Pilate, uh, and we're going to see, uh, if you look up coward in the dictionary, uh, you will find Pilate's picture. Uh, Pilate is the epitome uh, of a coward, uh, one who fails to stand up uh, for what is right, uh, not just what is right, but what he knows to be right. Uh, that's what's really uh, sad about Pilate's story, uh, is that he knew better than what he was doing. Uh, it's one thing uh, to act in ignorance, uh, but to know better, to know the truth, to know what is right, and fail to act on that truth uh, is the epitome uh, of a cowardice act. So I want to show you this morning uh, several characteristics as we walk uh, through this text, beginning in verse 12, uh, again, uh, of the characteristics uh, of a coward. The first one, uh, as I look in this text, beginning in uh, verse 12, it says, uh, in that passage, it says, From then on, Pilate sought to release him. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. Simply put, Pilate uh, has already now, on three different occasions, uh, in, in chapter 18, in the beginning of verse 19, on three different occasions, Pilate has reported to the Jews that I find no fault in this man. Uh, in one way or another, he has made that statement. This man is innocent. This man is not guilty. I find no reason uh, to proceed with a death penalty. Furthermore, if you read closely between the lines, Pilate says, I can't even give this man a parking ticket. I find absolutely no fault. He doesn't say, if you read that, he doesn't say, I find some fault, but not worthy of the death penalty. He says, I find no fault in this man. And then we read now in this passage that Pilate was of the mindset that he wanted to release 
Jesus. It, it was his mind. He had made up in his mind, I need to figure out a way to release this man. I find no fault in this man. That brings me to my first characteristic here uh, of a coward. Notice uh, that statement again. I find no fault. I, 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 it's in my mind. Uh, to release him. And so the first characteristic uh, that is somewhat, as I, as I thought about this, uh, is somewhat, for me anyway, the longer I thought about it, it makes sense. But at first, uh, as I studied this text, it, it, it startled me a little bit that his convictions were sincere. He says, I find no fault in this man. He made up in his mind to release him. And so Pilate had formed an opinion. And many times uh, when we think of a coward, uh, I think we think of someone uh, who, who doesn't uh, have, have an opinion. No, to be a coward, uh, I think it's mandatory. To, be a, to qualify as a coward, you have to have a conviction about something. Whatever it is, you have to have a conviction. The problem is, is that you have that conviction, but you don't act on that conviction. That, that's a coward. I've, I've shared with you, I, I know you've heard it before, uh, the story of the man walking the tightrope pushing a wheelbarrow uh, over Niagara Falls. And, and, and you know, there's a man on the, you know, clapping, cheering, hey, 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 do it again. He says, do you believe I can do it again? He says, absolutely, do it again. He says, we'll get in the wheelbarrow. Yeah. The man had a conviction. He believed he could walk across the tight wire. But he was a coward when it came to getting in to the wheelbarrow. See, I think that's where a lot of a lot of Christians are today. We've got convictions. We're just not willing to get in the wheelbarrow. We have convictions. We have beliefs. If you would go out into the churches across this area and, and you were to ask people, do you believe Jesus Christ is the way, the truth? Like, Absolutely. If you would ask people the song we just sang, do you believe that the grace of Jesus Christ is enough? Absolutely. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is virgin? Absolutely. Do you believe that abortion is wrong? Absolutely. Yeah, we have convictions, folks. You know, there's no question in my mind. We have convictions. We believe that Jesus Christ was virgin born. We believe he is the only way to heaven. We believe he is the Savior. We believe he is the answer for what is wrong in this world. We have those convictions. Just like Pilate. Pilate had convictions. It wasn't that Pilate, look again, it wasn't that Pilate thought Jesus was a bad man. In fact, Pilate was a little stunned by the thought where they said he's the son of God. He thought he might even be a, a God of some kind. He had convictions. He had beliefs. That, that, as, I, as I think about that, think, think that through for a moment. That is the, the, the foundation. You've you got to have a conviction before you can be a coward. You do. You don't have any convictions. You're not a coward. You just, I don't know what you are. But when you have a conviction that you're not willing to stand for, that is the definition of a coward. The church today does not have an issue with convictions. Christians do not have an issue with convictions. We may not have the convictions we had 34. But by and large, we, we have convictions. We have beliefs. We have belief about the Word of God. We have an understanding of what we think that the world needs. We, we, we have conviction about the return of Christ. We, we have convictions about those things. The problem is, like Pilate, Pilate says, I find no fault. Pilate says, I've made up my mind, I want to let him go. But then look at the next half of that verse. Now do we see that a character, the characteristic is the, the, the convictions are sincere, but the conflict is sober. You, you know the power of this little word right there in the middle of verse 12, right? It says, Pilate sought to release him, but, but the Jews cried out. The Jews cried out. The word cried out there it, it is a word that um, indicates uh, that, that they all cried out with one voice at one time. That they all together cried out, 
crucified together. Pilate, even though he had sincere convictions, we see in this verse that his conflict was sobering. His conflict was sobering. Imagine as he stood there and, and he looked out with all those Jews standing there. And, and, and again, Pilate, I don't want to say that I feel sorry for him exactly, but Pilate was in a mess. He allowed himself to be backed into a really bad situation. See, Pilate was the appointed governor of, of, of Judea. He was the governor of that area. And his one, well, he had two jobs. We've talked about this before. He had two jobs. Keep the peace and collect the tax. Keep the peace and collect the tax. And the last thing Pilate wanted was for news to get back to Rome get back to Tiberius Caesar that Pilate was failing in keeping the peace. That, the, that there was a man walking around claiming to be the king and he as governor had done nothing about it. His conflict was serious. Pilate is sitting there and, and, and have you ever been in a situation uh, like Pilate where, where, where you feel like you're being tugged at both ends? You know, Pilate is in one of those proverbial rock in a hard place positions. Pilate is in a situation where he, he's almost in a no-win situation. If he turns Jesus loose, then the Jews are going to tell on him to seize him. They're going to make some accusation. There's going to be a riot in town. That's going to be bad for Pilate. If Pilate uh, lets him be crucified, he's got to deal with his own conscience when he says, I think this man is innocent. And so the second characteristic of a coward is the conflict is real. The conflict is serious. Listen, Pilate was trying, again, it's easy to stand here uh, today in, in 2021 and look at Pilate and say, oh, Pilate ought to have done this. Pilate should have done that. Pilate, blah, 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 and just and tear Pilate up for his decision making. But the reality is, Pilate was in a life death situation, he was in a desperate situation. Listen, what I'm saying to you this morning is being pilot wasn't easy. I, I don't want to defend him too much, I, but listen, I don't, I, you know, he was in a hard situation. I, let's just be honest. I'm not saying he made the right decision. I'm not sympathizing with him too much. I just realize, I, I, I'm just being honest. It had been tough to be pilot that day. It had been hard to be pilot that moment. It's hard to be a Christian in an ungodly world. But somebody's got to do it. Pilate, you wanted a job when it was easy. You wanted a job when it came with fame and fortune. You wanted the authority. Remember what he told Jesus last week in our text? Don't you know I have the power to let you go or to crucify you? He wanted the power. He wanted the fame. He wanted the glory. He wanted the money. He wanted everything that came with the job. The problem is one of the things that comes with that job is making life and death decisions about people accused of a crime. Pilate... You liked that job yesterday. You got to do it today. And I think about how that applies to those who claim Christ as their Savior. We like the idea of going to heaven. We like the idea of forgiveness. We like the benefits of the job. The reality is, though, that being a Christian 
isn't always sunshine and roses. When I first went into management at the bakery, I asked my boss, the guy who would be my boss, the guy who was promoting me, I said, what kind of schedule do you want me to work? What kind of hours are you expecting out of this job? He says, I really don't care. He says, if you can do it, if you can, make, if you can run that job sitting on your couch on the telephone, I don't care. But if you have to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to get it done, don't call me and complain. Yeah. And there were a lot of days that I run it sitting on the couch on the telephone. And then Rondo will tell you, there were a lot of days. I don't know that it was ever 24-7, but doggone it was close a lot of times. Yeah. There were times, I can remember one in particular. He called me, paged me. Back in, remember pagers? Anybody remember pagers? He paged me and I called him back and he said, where are you? I said, I'm in Mooresville. Well, Mooresville was part of my area. He didn't ask me what I was doing. Because Lake Norman is also in Mooresville. Yeah. At that particular moment, I was crappy fishing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had on my uniform, but I was fishing. Yeah. Listen, and that was cool. The job got done. You take the good with the bad. And what we have to understand as Christians is there's some days, and, and, and honestly, in 2021, that, that, that we have the convictions. What we've got to understand is, again, there are days and times, and more frequently than not in a world we live in today, is the conflict serious. If you think being a Christian is going to get you nominated and voted in, as homecoming queen or most likely to succeed or whatever, you have a bad, bad rude awakening coming. The conflict is serious. See, not only the conflict, but we keep going. The, the contempt is startling. Look what he says. So Pilate, when he hears him say, that, that you're not Caesar's friend. He brings Jesus out. And remember, when he brings Jesus out by now, Jesus has been awake for somewhere probably 24 hours or more. He's been scourged. He's been beat up. He's been bounced around all over town. He's been verbally and physically and emotionally assaulted. By the time they bring him back out at this point, he is around. Pilate trots him out and says, puts him on display. And look what he says to him. As he brings him out, right before their Passover, it says, he says to him, Behold your king. He goes on. And he says, They cry out and say, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate asks, Shall I? Crucify your king. I wrestle with what to call this. Whether to call this contempt or callousness. See, one of the things that I think is a characteristic of a coward is, let's think about Pilate for a moment. It was very easy for Pilate to be a big guy. It was real easy for Pilate to be tough and to talk big. Don't you know I have the power to crucify you or the power to let you go? It's really easy to be tough when you got the Roman army behind you. Right? It's really easy when you've got several thousand Roman soldiers armed as well as they could be armed in that time, the strongest, the most elite of the crowd to enforce what you say. It's real easy to come out and talk tough on the porch surrounded by your soldiers. You want me to crucify your king? Behold your king. I have the power to release you. See, one of the other characteristics I think of a coward 
is, and you know this if you've seen cowards in any form, they talk big when they're surrounded by hell. They talk big when they got a lot of help and a lot of, I said, I don't care what kind of cowards you're talking about, whether you're talking about a schoolyard, uh, on the schoolyard, or whether you're talking about a, a cowardly Christian. We come into God's house where we're surrounded by like-minded people. Oh, praise the Lord. Yeah. Oh, glory to the Lord. I'm here, blah, 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 blah. We walk out those doors. We go into the workplace. We go into the marketplace. And all of a sudden, things get different. Things are far different when we're out in the world. I, I, I've shared with you, again, that the story of the fellow who asked me on the elevator in China, are you a Christian? You know. You riding in a, you're riding you're in the middle of Beijing, China, surrounded by a billion communists, atheistic communists, and one of them asks you if you're a Christian. You, you, your knees will get a little wobbly. I don't care who you are. You know, if you ask me in here, are you a Christian? Absolutely. Love Jesus. You put me in the middle of Beijing, China, on an elevator. Surrounded by atheists and communists everywhere I look. You ask me that same question. Now I've told you, I, it took me a minute to gather my senses, but I said, yes I am. You know, and I can tell you right now, I've told you, I don't know that I've ever been so thankful and happy in all my life. And he stuck out his hand and said, me too. <laughs> yeah, I ain't going to lie. I ain't going to lie. I'd like to tell you when he asked me that question, I guess, sir. <laughs> and some of y'all might. <laughs> More power to you. I hope to grow up to be you one day. But I'm telling you, <laughs> with all my, uh, just being honored, y'all know about that after all these years, I just tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. I got a little wobbly in the knees when he asked me that question. Because I've just been, again, I've just been told about a preacher who's been killed in Hong Kong. You know, I just been, just heard that story, and here this man is asking me if I'm a Christian. <laughs> that, that, that'll make you, you know, it's easy to be a Christian in church. It's easy to be tough when you're surrounded by the Roman army. What do you want me to do? You can almost hear the sarcasm in his voice. You want me to crucify your king? You can, you, you can hear the sarcasm. It's easy. Be bold when you got back up. What about tomorrow at work? What about today when you go to the store? What about today somewhere in the future where they start knocking on doors and rounding up Christians? It's easy to have convictions in church. It's easy to stand up and sing, oh, how I love Jesus in church. You see his convictions. You see his conflict. You see his contempt. Move on with me in the story. As it goes on, it says the Jews cried out, and they said, crucify, crucify. Crucify. We have no king but Caesar. I know some people don't like to, but if you are one who will and doesn't, you might want to underline those words right there. We have no king but Caesar. It was at that precise moment that Israel rejected the Messiah. There was, there has probably never been more hatred in anybody than the Jews had for Rome. Probably never been any more absolute hatred that anyone ever had than the Jews had for Caesar. 
except for the hatred they had for Jesus Christ. To stand there and say, we have no king. The confrontation. If you, here's reality, folks. If you have convictions, the day will come. The hour will come when those convictions will be challenged. Somewhere, somehow, if you have convictions, the moment will come when those convictions will be put to the test. It may be at work, may be in your own, in all likelihood, there's a really good chance it'll be in your own family. That if you take a stance, if you take a position, if you stand up for what is godly, and in, a, in, in, in all likelihood, there's a really good chance it'll be one of your own children, not just your family, but one of your own children. There are people sitting in this room, I could call their name and have them tell their story, who have had a conviction about an issue, only to have their own son or daughter come dead set against that conviction. Your convictions, if your convictions have never been challenged, can I really make you angry for just a moment? Can I get up in your business? If your convictions have never been challenged, I'd say there's a good chance you just don't have any. Because if you have convictions, they will be challenged. Pilate believed Jesus should be set free. And immediately, he gets punched in the face. What are you going to do about it? His own wife, John doesn't record it, Matthew does. His own wife came to him and said, Leave it alone, Pilate. I got a bad feeling about this one. His own convictions challenged. And then finally, look in this last verse, in verse 16. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Convictions lead to conflict, to contempt, to confrontation. Finally, his conduct was solved. I believe he's innocent. I believe he's innocent. I believe he's innocent. I've made up my mind to let him go. Take him to crucify. Is that not one of the saddest stories you can ever imagine? I believe he's innocent. I believe he's innocent. I believe he's innocent. I made up my mind to let him go. My own wife said, don't mess with him. Take him to crucify. The characteristics of a cow. Their conduct is solved. There's no verses to back what, I, what I'm about to say up. There's no way you can give an honest answer. But I want you to think for a moment. You know human nature. You know how the mind works. You know how we are, do you think that for the rest of his life, Pilate thought about that man that he was convinced was innocent, that he let be crucified? My hope, my prayer is that somewhere along the way, Pilate was so convicted and so bothered by it that he repented and asked Christ into his life to save him. That's my hope. That's for him. I really do. I, I say that in all seriousness. 
I wouldn't even send Pilate to hell. But sooner or later, when we have convictions, and folks, I, I, I believe this with all my heart. I believe in America, in the world we live in, in the direction our country is headed. It is much closer and much sooner than you might like to think or believe. But your convictions are going to be challenged. I, I hadn't asked permission to tell this story, but there's somebody sitting, somebody, somebody in our church family house that I'm going to be, because I didn't get permission to tell the story who works in a place who put up a LGBTQ or whatever all in sign or something in the break room where they had to eat. And they complained to the manager, the HR, and got it took down. The convictions have been challenged. You're going to have to decide, am I going to take a stand or not? I, I'm, I'm so proud of this person for taking that stand. Listen, do you, do you realize that our country just authorized the flying of the gay pride flag over our embassies? Our country has approved funding for abortion in other countries around the world. Our country has an openly homosexual Secretary of Transportation. Our country has an ugly transgender something as the Assistant Health Secretary. You don't think your Christian convictions are going to be challenged? There's no room for cowards in the church of Jesus Christ in 2021. No room. No room. We've sung for years, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Well, it's time to quit singing it and start doing it. In the workplace, in the marketplace, in our homes, stand up for Jesus. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. Wherever you are, in this room, at home, watching online, listening later, if you'd say to me today, I know, I know, I know that I am a Christian, that I am a child of God, that if I leave this world today, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven. No question, no doubt whatsoever. Then the question for us this morning is are we cowards or are we courageous? The story is told of Alexander the Great. He was leading his great army on a battle in the war. And they arrived, they landed their ships, and the soldiers got off the ships and went ashore, and Alexander had them set the ships on fire and burn them down. Burn them up. Told the soldiers, there's no going back. We came to fight. Folks, we need to burn our ships. There's no going back. If you're a child of God, would you pray this morning, God, give me courage. Give me courage. 
I don't want to be a coward. I want to stand for my convictions. But you're here today, you're watching online, and you don't know Christ as your Savior. You're afraid of what someone might say. You're afraid of what someone might do. You're concerned about the opinion of your family. My prayer this morning is that God would give you courage to step out in this room and come let me show you from God's Word how you can be saved. If you're online, send me a message, comment, call, so we can explain to you and tell you clearly and plainly how you can know Jesus Christ. There is no room for cowards. In the church of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you this morning for your word. And God, just as I said this morning that my prayer is that at some point, at some stage, Pilate recognized his error. He recognized that he had been standing before the Messiah, the very Son of God, repented of his sins, and asked Jesus Christ to save him. God, my prayer this morning is that anyone in this room, anyone online who doesn't know him personally, who doesn't know him as their Savior, God, that their heart would be convicted. God, that their, their heart would be stirred. God, they would see their need, and they would... Get over their fear, get over their concern, they would come to know Jesus Christ personally. God, I pray this morning that Christians online in this room, God, would be stirred, would be courageous, would be bold to stand for the truth of God's Word. To stand up against the immorality and the evil, the wickedness that is so pervasive in our nation. God, that we would stand up for what is right. God, I pray this morning you stir hearts that you move us. And we give you the honor for what you do. Which in Jesus' name I pray. And then as we stand together. <laughs>
chef prepared pre cooked meals uh, that uh, we, we distributed across the area to various people, shut ins, etc. Along with, I have no idea how much bread uh, is given to carloads of it, uh, 23 or 400 loaves of bread. Uh, and then with the promise that that would continue uh, to happen twice a week from now on. Uh, and so, Courage, uh, boldness uh, to stand for the truth of your word. 